Welcome back. We are going to pick up in our story as we follow the filtrate through the nephron, and we are going to look now at the loop of Henle. In the previous lecture, we looked at reabsorption in the proximal tubule, and we are going to continue to reabsorb in the loop of Henle. Before moving on, I want to remind you that there are actually two different types of nephrons. We have ones where the loop of Henle largely stays in the cortex. Those are called cortical nephrons. And then we have ones where the loop of Henle dips far down into the, the interior part of that nephron, the medulla, and those are called juxtamedullary nephrons. For our purposes, we are only going to concern ourselves with the juxtamedullary nephrons because they're interesting, even though they're actually less numerous than the cortical nephrons are. Okay, in the previous lecture, I forgot to go through the slide, so I'd like to do it now. It summarizes the reabsorption in the proximal tubule. Nothing here is new other than it just summarizes what we saw, which was a whole lot of reabsorption, kind of a, a surprising amount of reabsorption that occurs in that proximal tubule. And so just very quickly going through this, 67% of filtered uh, sodium is going to be reabsorbed in the proximal tubule alone. And here it says not subject to control. That's obligatory reabsorption, meaning that hormones are not adjusting it. In a previous lecture, two lectures ago, I said that obligatory reabsorption occurs in the proximal tubule and the loop of Henle, and then facultative reabsorption, where you get to adjust how much you want to take out, occurs in the distal tubule and the collecting duct. So here it says chloride follows passively. Remember that's mostly passively, um, and that's largely through an electrical gradient. All filtered glucose and amino acids should be reabsorbed. And again, this is using a sodium glucose co-transporter or a sodium amino acid co-transporter. This is both going to be obligatory and total, so it should be 100%. We didn't cover um, phosphate groups. Here, about two-thirds of the water is osmotically reabsorbed. Remember, water follows the solutes, not subject to control. It's all passive. 50% of urea is passively reabsorbed. Again, urea is mostly just going to follow the water. And then we did not cover um, potassium here. Okay, so we did not cover secretion. But I do want to mention this right here because it ties into our respiratory lectures and our acid-base balance. In previous lectures, we learned that the amount of carbon dioxide in your blood is your kind of your primary determinant of how much acid is also in your blood through that reversible reaction where CO2 and water combines to form carbonic acid. If there's too much CO2 in your bloodstream or too many ketone bodies um, from fat metabolism, then there's kind of two different mechanisms that your body has to try to bring that blood pH back up. One of which is through the respiratory system. So you'll start breathing more rapidly to try to clear out more CO2. But the other is to take hydrogen ions that are in the bloodstream and dump them into the urine. And that is done here. So this will not be on my test, but I think it's really interesting that we do have hydrogen ion secretion, um, which helps us manage our acid-base balance in our blood. Okay, let's now come back to the loop of Henle. Here, I have a bullet point list that showcases some of the major points that we need to understand. So in the loop of Henle, reabsorption continues to be obligatory which means that it is not under control of hormones, so it should happen the same way every time. There are only two things that are reabsorbed, water and salt. And salt, in this case, refers specifically to sodium and chloride ions. They tend to get treated uh, as one item together, even though technically they're dissociated. So when I say two things, I guess I really mean three things, water, sodium, and chloride, but it's often referred to as just water and salt reabsorption. I have an asterisk there because 
the place that water is reabsorbed is in a different section than where sodium and chloride is reabsorbed. So we're going to see that there's actually a division of duties. In one part of the loop of Henle, you're going to only reabsorb water. And then in the other part, you're only going to reabsorb sodium and chloride, which is a little different than how we did it in the proximal tubule, where it all kind of happened in the same spot. So why would you do a division like that? And the reason for this division is because it allows us to set up a very ingenious anatomical design called the countercurrent exchange system. And the countercurrent exchange system is what is going to allow us to do most of this reabsorption passively. So remember, in the proximal tubule, sodium drives everything, but you do have to pay for sodium. Here, we actually are going to have to pay a little bit for sodium, but very, very little. And most of the rest of it is free, just from this really cool design called the countercurrent system. Okay. If you were to ask a physiology instructor what their favorite topic is to teach, probably somewhere between 20 and maybe 50% of them would say the countercurrent system in the loop of Henle because it's just so neat. So I really hope that you can appreciate just how cool this system is going to be. We are going to turn and take a look at some drawings here in a little bit, but before I do that, I want to introduce you to an important concept. The medulla, and remember, we are only looking at the juxtamedullary nephrons. The medulla is salty, saltier than the cortex. So those numbers that you see there refer to osmolarity. Remember, the typical osmolarity of the cell of the extracellular fluid is going to be 290 milliosmoles, and we round up to 300 for convenience. Now, the cortex, which is shown in kind of a tan or a beige color, is in fact 300, but the medulla has a higher osmolarity, and it's a gradient. It goes from 300 to 400 to 500 to 600, all the way down to 1,200 milliosmoles at the very, very center of that medulla. And that is going to be important in our story. So let's go ahead and turn to the drawing pad and we'll take a look at uh, how reabsorption occurs in the loop of Henle. Before we do a deep dive into how the loop of Henle works, I first want to explore what might happen as the filtrate is exposed to extracellular fluid with an increasing uh, osmolarity. So in the previous slide, we saw that the medulla has an increasing osmolarity. It gets saltier as the loop of Henle travels down into the medulla. So that means the filtrate is exposed to that salt gradient. What happens? Well, here I have kind of a simplified version. Imagine that this box is my filtrate and that this box represents my extracellular fluid and I am separated by a membrane. In reality, it would be more than a membrane. It would be two membranes because you have an apical and a basolateral membrane. But for simplicity, we are just going to assume that it is one membrane and that membrane is here. So I clearly have a gradient of sodium chloride and I also have a gradient of water. And so two different processes want to happen passively. For starters, salt is going to want to diffuse down its own concentration gradient and move from the extracellular fluid into the filtrate. But water is also going to want to move. Water is going to want to go from the filtrate into the extracellular fluid. Remember that water follows solutes, and so water wants to go towards an area that is more concentrated in solutes. In other words, towards an area with a higher osmolarity. 
So we have these two different things that want to happen, but what will happen? That's the question. Is the salt going to be allowed to diffuse? Is the water going to diffuse? Are both going to diffuse? Neither. And that answer depends almost solely on the composition of that plasma membrane. So as it turns out, we can adjust the plasma membrane and make it more permeable to one substance or another and thus control what moves across that membrane. In the workbook, we learned that there is in fact a way to adjust the permeability of the plasma membrane to water. We can make a membrane incredibly permeable to water, or we can make the plasma membrane relatively impermeable to water. It's difficult to make a membrane, a plasma membrane, completely impervious to water, but we can at least make it very, very difficult for water to move. So I don't know if you recall those two uh, structural changes that we can make to the plasma membrane to adjust the permeability, so I'll review them here. They are adding or removing aquaporins, those are going to be channel proteins that are made just for water, and or changing the amount of cholesterol that is embedded in that lipid bilayer. So if I want to make a membrane relatively impermeable to water, then I am going to pack the plasma membrane with cholesterol, By adding cholesterol, I reduce the gaps in between the phospholipids and thus make it more difficult for a water molecule to play frogger across that plasma membrane and make it to the other side. The other thing that I can do is make sure there are no special channel proteins for water. So I remove all aquaporins from the plasma membrane. And if I do those two things, then I have made my membrane just about as impermeable to water as I can. Let's consider the opposite. On the opposite side, if I want to make my membrane incredibly permeable to water, I would load up the plasma membrane with aquaporins, and I would reduce the amount of cholesterol in the lipid bilayer. Now these represent extremes, but I could make this really a sliding scale where I adjust the permeability of my membrane uh, to water by basically adjusting the amount of cholesterol and or aquaporins. If I remove all the aquaporins and pack it with cholesterol, I'm really at one end of that spectrum. And if I try to get as rid of as much cholesterol as I can, can and pack it with aquaporins, I'm at the other end of the spectrum. Okay, so how do I adjust the permeability of the plasma membrane to sodium chloride? And this is actually a little bit of an easier answer. Because sodium chloride um, dissociates into positive and negatively charged ions in an aqueous solution, they are repelled by the phospholipid bilayer core. Remember that public enemy number one for our uh, lipids is actually ions. So lipids and ions detest each other, and when the ions try to get close uh, to that lipid bilayer, they are repelled, which is why channel proteins are so important to allow lipids to cross. So if I want to make a membrane impermeable, to sodium and or chloride, I simply just remove all ways for sodium and chloride to move across that membrane. And that is to remove all the channel proteins. Conversely, I simply insert a whole bunch of sodium and or chloride channels and I make my membrane very permeable to sodium and chloride. So now that we've looked at ways that we can adjust a plasma membrane's permeability to both water and sodium chloride, 
let's come back up to this image here. So what's going to happen? Is the salt going to move from the extracellular fluid to the filtrate as shown here? Or is water going to move as shown here? And the answer depends on what your membrane looks like. Imagine that I take that plasma membrane and I remove all of the aquaporins, load it with cholesterol, and add in a bunch of sodium and chloride channels. What would happen? Only the sodium would move across because that membrane would be very permeable to sodium and very impermeable to water. Consider this scenario. I take that same plasma membrane, I remove all sodium and chloride channels, but I put in a bunch of aquaporins and I remove most of my cholesterol. What's going to happen? In that case, we expect that the primary substance to move is going to be water. Water will largely move from the filtrate to the ECF and the sodium and chloride will pretty much stay put in that ECF. Okay, those are important concepts to understand as we take a look at our loop of Henle. In this image here, I've drawn out a loop of Henle as it dips down into the uh, medulla. So this is a juxta medullary nephron, which means that the loop of Henle extends from the cortex region of that kidney down into the medulla. And along the way, that filtrate is going to be exposed to an osmotic gradient. You could imagine then that this filtrate, which starts with an osmolarity of 290 milliosmoles coming out of the proximal tubule, I've rounded up to 300 for um, simplicity, but as that filtrate starts to travel down that descending loop of Henle, it's going to be exposed to an osmotic gradient and two different things want to happen. The first thing that wants to happen is that water is going to want to leave and go this way. But the other thing that's going to want to happen is that salt is going to want to come in. So what will happen? Well, it turns out that the membrane of the descending loop of Henle is engineered so that it is very permeable to water while remaining impermeable to sodium and chloride. So let's take a moment to write that down. So as that filtrate moves down the loop of Henle, we expect that water will move freely, but sodium and chloride will not. So let's go ahead and follow the area that I have boxed as it moves from an osmolarity in the cortex of 300 down to into the medulla where it is exposed to an increasing osmotic gradient. To make this easier, I'm going to go ahead and actually delete some of this around my little orange box. I simply just drew it up to show you that the osmolarity there is about 300. And again, you can see that my osmolarity definitely increases. In fact, it doubles from here to here, and it triples from 300 to 900, and then quadruples by the time I get down to 1200. So I'm going to go ahead and take this box and start moving it down. Okay, so what's going to happen once that box gets there? Once that box gets there, it's exposed to this gradient here, and again, either salt is going to want to move into the filtrate, or water is going to want to move out of the filtrate and into the extracellular fluid. Well, since this membrane is only permeable to water, only water is allowed to move. 
So water is going to leave that filtrate and be reabsorbed. So you'll notice here that I have reabsorbed some of my water, and I'm showing that with these arrows here. And as water leaves my filtrate, the volume of my filtrate shrinks. And that is evident here. So notice that the volume shrinks, but the number of dots, which I actually have is 12 in there, has not changed. So the number of sodium and chloride ions that are in the filtrate remain unchanged, but the water has been reabsorbed. And so the water that is left in that little box of filtrate is going to be less than what it was when we started. We're gonna go ahead and take this little box of filtrate and continue to move it down, but it's going to be exposed to an even saltier gradient. So more water is going to be reabsorbed. So let's go ahead and quickly draw that. I'll show it to you this time. And so the volume of our filtrate has decreased even more as water continues to be reabsorbed. By the time the filtrate travels down here, we've gone from 54 liters per day at this checkpoint to 18 liters per day at that checkpoint. And so the filtrate has been dehydrated but the osmolarity of the filtrate is going to match the osmolarity of the extracellular fluid. So I'm going to draw this one more time. More water is being reabsorbed. And now we have even a smaller box. So the osmolarity of filtrate, by the time it reaches this loop, the bottom of the loop of Henle here, is 1200 milliosmoles. And we have done a lot of water reabsorption. Now that filtrate is going to take a trip back up to the cortex through the ascending loop of Henle where it's going to be exposed to the gradient, but in a reverse order. So it will go from a concentrated gradient back to a more dilute gradient. And so if you think about that, there is a real potential to undo everything you just did. As I take this filtrate back up, water wants to move back in and rehydrate my filtrate. And I can't let that happen, or everything that I just did is a complete waste. So what I'm going to do is prevent water from coming back into the filtrate by making the ascending loop of Henle actually impermeable to water. But I now have an opportunity to reabsorb salt. So the ingenious design behind the loop of Henle is actually in its membrane structure. So we're gonna go ahead and make the ascending loop of Henle impermeable to water, but very permeable to sodium and chloride. Okay, so let's start taking that filtrate back up. And this time, salt is going to be allowed to move while water will not. So as I take this back up, remember that the gradient in here right now is 1200 compared to a gradient of 900. So what's actually going to happen is some of my salt is going to move this way and be reabsorbed. So let me go ahead and draw that. I'll remove some salt from here. And put it over here. That filtrate now has an osmolarity of 900. Notice the volume did not change. It's gonna move up here. A little bit more salt is going to move. 
like so. And we are going to finish our trip up and finish removing that salt. Now, something might have occurred to you here that the trip back up the ascending loop of Henley is actually what sets up the gradient in the first place that allows for water reabsorption down the descending loop of Henley. It may take a moment to really understand how that's possible, but consider for a moment that we have a gradient set up here and we are only look at the, looking at the descending loop of Henley and water is being reabsorbed. Well, isn't that reabsorbed water actually going to be diluting out these gradients here? I mean, if you reabsorb enough water, you'll simply take those uh, sodium chloride molecules and disperse them. And so, yes, it will reduce the gradient. So you will continually undo that gradient. So that gradient has to be restored constantly and it's restored coming back up. So the trip back up the ascending loop of Henley restores the gradient needed to draw water out in the first place, which is really ingenious. And this is actually done with some clever um, blood flow through the vasa recta. I will tell you that in my class, I am not that interested in the blood flow. I'll show you an image here in just a little bit, but in other classes, you may need to understand that blood flow in more detail. I'm drawing this as if it's occurring in the interstitial fluid, but in reality, it's actually occurring mostly in the blood, and the blood is moving in the opposite direction as the filtrate in what is known as a countercurrent system. You can read about that more on your own if you would like. For my particular class, I don't really give that a lot of consideration. It's enough if you understand that I'm referring to the extracellular fluid here. What makes this work is largely the differently engineered descending and ascending loop of Henle. The descending loop of Henle is permeable to water, so only water is allowed to be reabsorbed. And the ascending loop of Henle is permeable only to sodium and chloride, and so sodium chloride is allowed to be reabsorbed. Both of these are done largely passively up unto this spot right here where I'm making a dash line. Now, the osmolarity in the cortex is 300 milliosmoles, but as I move this filtrate up into the distal tubule, I want to remove a little bit more salt. I actually want my osmolarity of the salt to be about 100. And I can't do that for free. The only way that I can do that is with active transport. So we do reabsorb a little bit more salt here. Such that the final osmolarity as we come up into the distal tubule is 100 milliosmoles. And this section that I'm kind of making in dark black here, this is active. This is active transport or active reabsorption. You have to pay for this because you're moving uh, sodium and chloride from a lower concentration into an area with a higher concentration. Okay, so let me show you that picture of that countercurrent exchange and then we'll wrap this up. So I mentioned the countercurrent exchange system and I did say I would show you a picture. If you are in my class, I do not typically teach this part of it, but I do like students to be aware of what a countercurrent exchange system is um, because it's often referred to as a countercurrent exchange system. So when somebody is talking about uh, reabsorption in the loop of Henley, sometimes it will just be described as, oh, it's the countercurrent system in the kidney. You go, well, what, what is that? 
So the word counter refers to opposite, right? So counter current in this case refers to the fact that you have your filtrate going one direction and your blood going another direction. And you can see that here. The vasorectra, which is the peritubular capillaries that surround these juxtamedullary loop of Henle, um, is going to go this direction and the filtrate goes the opposite direction. The fact that the blood and the filtrate are in fact going the opposite directions is what allows for that gradient that I just use as the extracellular fluid, fluid gradient, which of course plasma is a type of extracellular fluid. So feel free to look at this if you'd like, but again, for my exam, I'm not gonna make you understand how the blood moves in the opposite direction and the importance of that. Rather, I just want you to know that it is important and it does definitely um, drive this system and allow almost all of this reabsorption to occur passively. All right, that concludes our lecture on the loop of Henle. In our next lecture, we are going to take a look at our distal tubule and our collecting duct.